let us start with a brief introduction of money and banking. In India, the RBI as a designated monetary authority has no control over the deficit financing of the central government and only limited control over its foreign exchange assets. We will discuss the instruments of control wielded by the RBI. We will also focus on the instruments of policy and the goals of policy. After starting this module, you shall be able to know about the goals and targets of monetary control, identify different instruments of monetary control, comprehend different ratios used for monetary control. We need to define the terms policy instruments, targets, intermediate targets and policy regimes. Microeconomic policy making can involve several variables such as government spending, taxes and transfers in addition to the money supply. Policy instruments are variables the policy maker can control. Policy goals or targets are variables which represent the policy maker's goals. These cannot be controlled directly by the policy maker. Government actions to change any of the first three variables are called fiscal policy actions to distinguish them from actions to change the money supply, which are monetary policy actions. Let us now understand the role of intermediate targets. It lies between the complex linkage between instruments and final targets. These targets need not to be a desirable policy goal in and of itself. They are a means of achieving final target more easily. The RBI finds it convenient to adopt an intermediate target instead of directly aiming instruments at a target. Let's take a very simple example to understand these concepts. Suppose you need to reach a dinner party by 8 p.m. Instruments to manipulate steering wheel, brakes and accelerator. Randomness in the link between the instruments and targets. Possibility of facing road construction, traffic accidents or possible mechanical problems. Intermediate target while planning your trip, you can decide a route from your house to the party. Note that the route is only a device that will help to get to the party if followed correctly. That is, achieving intermediate target, but following the route will not in and of itself make you better off. Operating procedures are also known as operating or policy regimes. It is a combination of intermediate targets and procedures for using the policy instruments to achieve the targets. Example, the RBI might choose a particular level of a money supply, M1, as an intermediate target and use certain open market operations to achieve it. Policy targets means the final target or goal and should be distinguished from intermediate target. Monetary policy goals are of two types, macroeconomic goals, goals for the entire economy, financial sector goals, goals interpreted as that of maintaining some type of stability in interest rates. Financial sector goals also have macroeconomic implications. Let us now have a look at different categories of macroeconomic goals, economic growth, measured as the growth rate of real GDP, real personal income, or even the size of investment in capital structures and equipment, the government and the RBI benefits from growing economy and wants to stimulate growth. Price stability, measured by the stability of the inflation rate and by the amount by which inflation exceeds a target level. Price stability entails both a low inflation rate, perhaps zero rate, and a stable inflation rate. Stabilization of business cycles, major concern of RBI, policy actions aimed at counteracting business cycle influences on the economy are called counter cyclical policy. Set of all other goals includes interest rate and exchange rate stability, desirable as an intermediate target for helping achieve first three goals, may also be a goal in and of itself considering financial sector stability. Now we shall discuss 
these categories of macroeconomic goals in detail. The first is economic growth which might be measured as the growth rate of real GDP, real personal income or even the size of investment in capital structures and equipment that will lead to future growth. The government and hence the RBI benefits from a growing economy and wants to stimulate growth. The second goal is price stability and might be measured by the stability of the inflation rate and by the amount by which inflation exceeds a target level. Thus, price stability entails both a low inflation rate, perhaps zero, and a stable inflation rate so that inflation rate is not jumping from 2 to 4 to 6 percent and back to 2 percent in successive months. A third category of macroeconomic goals is stabilization of the business cycle. The RBI wants to counteract the effects of the business cycle, especially the rise in unemployment and the fall in output during recessions. Policy actions aimed at counteracting business cycle influences on the economy are called counter cyclical policy and are a major concern of the RBI. The fourth category is a set of all other goals not contained in the first three categories. We already mentioned one such goal that is interest rate stability. This might be desirable as an intermediate target for helping to achieve one or more of the first three goals, but it may also be a goal in and of itself, perhaps motivated by considerations of financial sector stability as described above. Another variable the RBI might consider is the exchange rate because the exchange rate influences exports and imports and hence the trade balance. The RBI may have as a goal of stability of the exchange rate or even a target level of the exchange rate. This is specially true because wide fluctuations in the exchange rate can also contribute to financial market instability. It is important to point out however that the US Treasury takes first responsibility for direct intervention in the exchange market. The Federal Reserve System's role is less direct. It stands by to counteract domestic money supply influences of treasury actions in the foreign exchange market and these monetary actions can have an indirect influence on the exchange rate. Instruments of policy for the RBI are open market operations, one, discount rate and discount window policy, two, required reserve ratio, CRR and SLR, three, selective credit controls. Changes in these instruments will change either the monetary base or money multiplier and hence change the money supply. Open market operations stand for the purchase and sale of government securities by the RBI from to the public and banks on its own account. In its capacity, RBI buys all the unsold stock of new government loans at the end of subscription period. The RBI thereafter keeps them on sale in the market on its own account. These are not genuine market purchases. It constitutes only internal arrangement between the government and the RBI.
the theory of open market operations as an instrument of monetary control is quite simple. Every open market purchase by the RBI increases H, H being the high powered money by equal amount. Every sale decreases it. Thereafter, the money multiplier process takes over and affects the supply of M in the standard way. It matters little whether the RBI buys or sells securities from or to banks or the non-bank public except that in the former case the reserves of bank, banks are affected directly, in the latter case indirectly. We are of course assuming that the banks remain fully loaned up all the time. That is that their actual excess reserves are always equal to their desired excess reserves. There are side effects too via changes in government bond rates of interest. But in India, because of the captive nature of the government bond market and the RBI's monopoly position, these effects are rather small. In India, the open market operations of the RBI have not been a powerful instrument of monetary control. For such a role, at least three conditions must be satisfied. One, the market for government securities should be well organized and developed, that is broad, deep and resilient. Two, the central bank should have enough capacity to buy and sell securities. Three, the central bank in its conduct of these operations should not be weighed down by weightier considerations than monetary control. Of these, only condition two is well satisfied. Discount rate is the rate at which the Reserve Bank is ready to buy or rediscount bills of exchange or other commercial papers. It also signals the medium term stance of monetary policy. RBI lends to the commercial banks through its discount window to help the banks meet depositors' demands and reserve requirements for long term. Rise in bank rate, dear money policy that increases the cost of borrowing. Fall in bank rate, cheap money policy reducing the cost of borrowing. Cash reserve ratio. The reserve bank requires banks to maintain a certain amount of cash in reserve as a percentage of their deposits to ensure that banks have sufficient cash to cover customer withdrawals through a computerized and centralized system for accurate monitoring of balances maintained by the banks with the reserve bank. An increase in cash reserve ratio reduces the excess reserve of the banks. Decrease in CRR increases the excess reserve of the banks. The statutory liquid ratio for banks is yet another tool of monetary control in the hands of the RBI. There are two distinct ways in which the SLR operates as an instrument of monetary control. One is by affecting the borrowings of the government from the RBI. The other is by affecting the freedom of banks to sell government securities or borrow against them from the RBI. In both the ways, the creation of H is affected and thereby variations in the supply of money. Now we will understand the variations in reserve requirement. Banks always keep a certain proportion of their total assets in the form of cash, partly to meet the statutory reserve requirement and partly to meet their own day-to-day -day needs for making cash payments. Cash is held partly in the form of cash on hand and partly in the form of balances with the RBI. All such cash is called cash reserves of banks. 
they are usually divided under two heads one required reserves and two excess reserves required reserves are cash balances which a bank is required statutorily to hold with the RBI besides required reserves banks also hold excess reserves which are reserves in excess of the required reserves it is only these excess reserves reserves which banks as a whole can use to meet their currency drains that is net withdrawal of currency by the depositors as well as clearing the drains that is net loss of cash due to the cross clearing of checks among banks a large part of the excess reserve banks hold in the form of cash on hand or vault cash with themselves the remaining small part they hold as excess balances with the rbi excess reserves are very much a behavioral function of the banks banks always try to so adjust their asset portfolios that their actual excess reserves are equal to their desired excess reserves this simple but key point can explain much of the behavior of the banks and the money supply mechanism the control measure of variable reserve ratio attempts to affect the stock of money via the impounding or release of bank reserves when the average crr is revised upwards banks are required to hold larger reserves or balances with the rbi than before for the same amount of liabilities this amounts to leaving the required reserve ratio unchanged but impounding of additional reserves by the rbi in the opposite case when the crr is lowered or the incremental crr withdrawn this amounts to releasing of reserves now we will understand the changes in the cost and availability of reserve bank credit to the banks in terms of traditional central banking theory as well as practice the caption of this section should have been bank rate policy but the conditions governing the rbi rbc to banks an important source of change in h in india are much more complex than what the simple theory of bank rate policy implies these are explained along with traditional theory of bank rate policy in the present section the rbi provides credit to banks in two forms a as advances against eligible security such as government securities and other approved securities and b as rediscounts of eligible usens bills under its bills rediscounting scheme of november 1970 credit is provided to banks partly in fulfillment of the traditional central banking functions and partly for promoting certain new policy objectives under the former we may place the lender of last resort function and the provision of busy season and finance under the latter we may place refinance facilities and rediscounting under its bills rediscounting scheme as a lender of last resort a central bank always stands ready to come to the rescue
of a bank or banks in temporary need of cash when other sources of raising cash are practically closed or have become prohibitively costly. The RBI also lends to banks to help them provide busy season finance to the economy during the months of November to April when the demand for funds traditionally increases to finance the marketing of major kharif crops and banks are subjected to currency drains as the public moves out of deposits into currency. The RBI also uses its lending power to banks. One, to influence their credit allocation and two, to develop a genuine bill market in India. It does the former under its refinance facilities to banks and the latter under its bills rediscounting scheme and both at concessional rates of interest. Refinance means providing finance to banks partly or wholly against credit extended by them to designated priority sectors. Let us now study the traditional theory of bank rate policy. Formally, the bank rate is the rate at which the RBI should be prepared to buy or rediscount eligible bills of exchange or other commercial paper. In actual practice, however, it is extremely difficult to predict precisely the effect of a change in the bank rate on the amount of bank borrowings let along on M. For this effect will depend on several factors such as A. The degree of bank's dependence on borrowed reserves. B. The sensitivity of the bank's demand for borrowed reserves to the differential between their lending rates and borrowing rates. C. The extent to which the other rates of interest have already changed or changed subsequently. D the state of the demand for loans and the supply of funds from other sources. Let us now understand what statutory liquidity ratio is. The statutory liquidity ratio called SLR for banks is yet another tool of monetary control in the hands of RBI. For aggregative monetary control it works indirectly rather than directly therefore its role as a tool of monetary control is not fully understood the chief direct role of slr is to govern howsoever imperfectly the allocation of total bank credit between the government and the commercial sector the indirect role of monetary control is played through this direct role. There are two distinct ways in which the SLR operates as an instrument of money control. One is by affecting the borrowings of the government from the RBI. The other is by affecting the freedom of banks to sell government securities or borrow against them from the RBI. In both the ways, the creation of edge is affected and thereby variations in the supply of money. Moral suasion is a combination of persuasion and pressures which a central bank is always in a position to use on banks in general and errant banks in particular. This is exercised through discussions, letters, speeches and hints thrown to banks. It can be used both for quantitative control of credit and money supply and for qualitative control of credit, that is, control over the distribution of bank credit. In respect of the former, moral suasion can be used by the RBI to urge banks to keep a large proportion of their assets in the form of government securities, lending their helping hand to develop a broad and active market in treasury bills and other government securities, and not borrow excessively from the bank when it is engaged in fighting the forces of inflation. It offers some scope for the RBI to exercise control over money supply. Selective credit controls operate on the distribution of total credit, it regulates the use of credit by discriminating between essential and non-essential purposes. 
may regulate higher purchases and installment transactions. It can stipulate the rates of interest on different types of bank advances, may prescribe margins against secured advances. These methods prevent speculation and hoarding of commodities. Let us now understand selective credit controls in detail. The instruments of control discussed so far are commonly known as general or quantitative methods of credit control. While the regulation of credit for specific purposes is termed as selective or qualitative credit control. Whereas the general credit controls relate to the total volume of credit via changes in H and the cost of credit, selective credit controls operate on the distribution of total credit. The latter can have two main aspects, positive and negative. On the positive front, measures can be used to encourage greater channeling of credit into a particular sector as is being done in India in favor of designated priority sectors. On the negative side, measures are taken to restrict the flow of credit to particular sectors or activities. Most of the time, the term selective credit control is used in this latter sense. Thus stated, the degree of success of SCCs will depend upon several factors discussed below. 1. The extent of effective credit restrictions. Since SCCs are generally security oriented and not purpose oriented, influential borrowers can manage to escape the bite of these measures by borrowing against the security of other collaterals and using the funds so borrowed for indulging in the speculative holding of stocks. Therefore, the effectiveness of SCCs is likely to improve if they are fully supported by general credit controls. 2. The availability of non-bank finance. To the extent traders do not depend upon banks for financing their inventories and have other sources of finance, for example their own and of the unregulated credit markets, they will again escape the constraints of the SCCs. With black money rapidly multiplying in the economy, this factor is becoming more and more important over time so that even if the bank credit is effectively restricted in particular direction, speculative holdings may not be curtained much. Obviously, much will depend on the cost and availability of non-bank finance to the parties concerned. 3. The degree of shortfall in supply in relation to normal demand. The greater this shortfall, the more will the speculative fever rise. In cases of acute shortages, credit controls should be imposed well in time without waiting for the prices of the sensitive commodities to actually rise. From the above brief discussion, it can be inferred that SCCs can at best serve as useful supplements to general credit controls and will be more successful in company with the latter than without them. In this module, you have learned about the goals of the RBI, which is the Central Bank of India, and discussed the goals that it had to achieve according to the state of the economy, and further delve into the instruments that it had at its disposal.
We looked at how effective these were given the state of penetration of various instruments that the RBI had at its disposal.